Yeah, if you didn't, uh, were not here today, the reason I present three talks in a row is that because I didn't know which one uh, to apply for, so I applied all three and they accepted all three. So I was like, bring it on, I won't back down, and all three in a row, yeah. Not in parallel, but yeah, one after each other at least. So this is schizophrenic star files, and this is a talk that I initially designed and presented with Ginfeld Colwin, who's security researcher at Google, and mostly known for, or maybe known for being the head of Dragon Sector, which is one of the top CTF teams this year. So they talk encrypted in Polish, and they are very good. And uh, so this is me, Angel Bertini, doing reverse engineering and visual documentations and sharing them on web my website, corecommune.com. So the idea behind the title, and this is uh, you have create a file with two contents. It's same type, it's not a polyglot, but one program will see one content and the other program will ignore the other and see something completely different. So that's our schizophrenia. Same type, both programs look like they're working fine, but they see something different. So two different contents, and it, this is not the case where there is something in the file that says, oh, is my viewer currently a dog reader? Then let's do this. No, this is not something like this. It's like passive at parsing level. It's parsing mistakes. It's not a, a trick saying, hey, is this navigator Internet Explorer? Hot, and then let display this. No, that's not. That's not it. So it's about fooling and not failing. So no errors, no reported errors, and no exploitation. So it's different use of uh, weird binaries, I'd say. And the reason for that is just fun, but it's also very good to bypass security. So same origin policy, evade detection, exfiltration, and sometimes it kills the signing of like Android, and suddenly you can create, uh, you can forge your own APK uh, with a different signature because of zip schizophrenia. So let's start with zip, the most known of them and the weirdest maybe. Uh, Ginfeil originally did a talk in Polish, so anyone can read Polish? Yeah, read it. Yeah, it's encrypted, you see. <laughs> Sorry for that, but yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, the, 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 he translated the slides, but the initial uh, talk was fully in Polish, and so that's why I suggested that we do it in English. Thanks, sorry. So I did a poster on the zip file format, uh, which is made of structures like the local file header, which contains information about each file, central directory that just locates the, this information, and one end of central directory. So we have this little weird structure that we see here. So the start of the file, each compressed file are archived, then you have central directories, one after each other, that are pointing to them. And then after all the central directories, you have an end of central directory at the end of the archive that points to this one. So you have to parse it backward, officially. And actually, each file name is duplicated. It's presented in a central directory, but it's also in each of the local file directory next to the file data. Anyone know why this, there is this weird structure? I'm the only old guy here. Because f zip were used on, to, to be split on floppies, creating floppies on the fly. So basically, you could archive 10 megabytes on over one megabyte floppy, and, to meet, and you would insert the first floppy, it would start putting data. Then it would say, oh, the floppy is full. I, I need another disk. Then once all files are archived, it starts writing all the central directories. And at the end, it starts, it writes the end of central directory. So to unpack, you actually insert the last floppy, and you said, I want this file, and then it tells you, okay, you need to insert another file, another floppy. So basically, this weird structure was made to be split over different floppies, and to minimize the floppy swaps. So basically, you, to extract one file from a big archive, you would, this was, structure was really well thought to minimize the floppy swapping, because floppies were already really slow, so if on top of that you have to insert the same floppy twice or something. So that was well thought, but now it's awkward. Now nobody uses floppies anymore, at least uh, only maybe for Amiga emulation. But anyway, uh, and new archive formats are passed top down. So this weird structure is from the past, not used anymore, but we have to live with it, especially now that zip is everywhere, including in Android. So first, because of this weird structure, the position of the file can be just anywhere. So you could be, have prepended and appended data. Now, 
if there is too much appended data, normal archivers are only looking for a small space here. So if the space is too big, it will fail to locate that. A trick to bypass that, if you need that, like making a PDF zip schizophrenia, for example, then you can duplicate this structure because it's very small and put it a second one at the end, and then it, the parser will be happy. Okay. Now the scanning directions. Uh, if you concatenate two archives, then if you parse from bottom up uh, as a standard, then you will find this structure. But if you, for some reason, parse it top down, which is not a standard, but why not? Because usually there are not two, two archives in the same file, then you would find another one. So that's the first easy case of schizophrenia. Now, if you look at it, What's important now is that this is all on the same floppy nowadays, and what is, you could parse everything nicely, but what only matters is actually the file name and data that is here. So basically, if you just ignore the rest and look at, just look at this, you would still find the archived file and their content. So why bothering looking down the, this weird deprecated structure? And once again, one file is one local file header. header. And because most standard zip are still are always starting with a sequence without any gap of local file header, then if you would just parse from the beginning local file headers and stop until it's not a local file header, you would still get the, the files in 99% of the zip. Like, it's not a standard way of parsing, but it's a very efficient one. So the standard parsing is going from the bottom and parsing all those old headers. And a very efficient parsing less, uh, parsing, less standard, is just to go from the start and look for local file headers. And it's good enough in most standard case. Also, so yeah, nowadays most zips are a sequence of local file headers from the start. Zip archive command, one last thing, is that actually in the end of central directory you can have comments which can be null or which can be up to 64K. And in this command, you can put another file. Why not? Remember, this looks funny, but when it suddenly it's breaking the signing of Android, it's suddenly it's more interesting, right? So, just to recap, the passing direction, the standard is bottom-up with all the headers, but you could just pass for the local file headers from the start. The zip should be located near the end of the file, in this case of standard parsing, or at least if you, it's not, then duplicate the end of central directory. And an archive command can contain another complete archive. So let's look for this and create an abstract painting zip, which is open to four different interpretations. So you have one archive that contains another archive in its comment, and before you have a single local file header at the start of the file, then some gap to break the syntax, and then another standalone local file header. So you have four files archived and four ways to pass this archive. So basically, if you take the standard way, pass it bottom up, you will find this file because you go from the bottom, you find this, okay, oh, I found this file, and this is the most standard way of parsing. So those, all those tools find this U file. Now, this one is the weirdest because it's not the most efficient and it's not standard. So instead, they do the same thing and stuff, but they look from the start for this instead of from the bottom. And then they say, oh, now I found the D file. Okay. So, sorry? Uh, okay. So only a few tools, PHP, uh, are using, are finding, are using this parsing. It doesn't make much sense because it's not so efficient. Then, Ruby and Java are actually just looking for local file headers at the start of the file. And then, if you take a forensic-like tool like Binwalk, it just looks for a local file header at any offset, and it finds actually all four of them. So you have a single file, and the four different ways of parsing it and the contents, each tool will be happy. Hey, I found this file, I found this file. The proof of concepts are available, of course, and uh, no error reported. Uh, every parser thinks it has done its job correctly. So now let's go for the PDF. We saw that a bit in details before. Uh, I also, yeah, referred to the talk before and referred to my talk at Mannheim in Raumzeit Labor. And just as a very short reminder, the PDF is a sequence of objects that refer to each other. And the trailer references the root object. So basically, the trailer at the bottom of the file 
says this is the root object, and then the whole document comes from defining this root. So how is the trailer object defined? So the trailer says the starts cross-reference line should be should be preceded by the trailer dictionary. Okay, so you have it just before the static ref, you should have trailer, which has a trailer keyword. And also, and from the trailer, you, you determine the root object, and from the root object, the whole complete document structure. So here, we have three different lines. This is actually a comment, so this should be ignored as a comment. This is a standard trailer declaration, and this is a corrupted trailer declaration because the trailer keyword is absent. So in theory, if you follow the specs, this doesn't work, this works, and this works. If you put all these three in the same file and you have a different, complete different structure together in the file, you get this. So this is the same file. As usual, the images were chosen randomly. And this is Adobe, which is following the specs. This is Chrome, that is thinking, even if it's a command, let's parse it. And this is Sumatra, that just thinks there's no keyword, but let's take it as a trailer. So this is the same file, right? And once again, it's not just a trick on the picture. These are three complete different documents. You could, you could have your secret master thesis and then uh, the picture of Barack Obama together. It doesn't matter. It's not, the document they see is completely different. The dimensions could be different and so on. So another thing is that here it's not because of pointers. All, the whole file is always passed totally by each of the reader. But the thing is, the reader see a completely different document, but you have the objects of each document coexisting together. But it doesn't matter, the viewers don't care if some objects are unused. The PDF specs don't specify that. So they just only read the presence, oh, there's a picture of Barack Obama, but hey, my pages, my page content points to this picture, which is Angela Merkel, so yeah, I mean, why not? So, and also it's available in PDFA flavor, who knows? Who doesn't know who what PDFA is? So PDFA is the what your um, HR uh, finance department cares about. PDFA is a, a subset of PDF made for archiving. So basically, it's required by all financial institutions not to store as PDF, but just to make sure that files are stored in PDFA. So basically, PDFA kind of guarantees that the file will be readable in the future. Right? It's it's a standard, right? So basically, it, you shouldn't be. You can mess with PDF, but PDFA is much more strict, and you should be able to mess with PDFA. Uh, okay, so the actual way to check for perfect validity of PDFA is to use the Adobe Preflight, which is a, a, a tool you have to pay. Okay, so basically, this PDFA is not valid, but PDF, for Preflight, so it's not strictly PDFA. But if you open it, Adobe Reader, which is the standard way. It say, hey, this file is PDFA, standard. So suddenly it says, well, it's supposed to be really clean and uh, compliant to some standard, but this is the same file again. What? Here it's a text, and if you open the same file with Chrome, then you see my logo. And sometimes it's in the specs. Uh, the problem is that if you have too much stuff in the specs, then not everybody knows about them. Do you see anything wrong here? Yeah, it's just a tiny detail, but basically this means that the document contains layers. What does it mean? It means you can do that. So you have the document, and you say print, and the content to be printed is just different, and there's no warning. So you should just ask that when you ask for a, you know, like a salary increase or is this kind of stuff, you know, because you don't necessarily check the preview, or you can put the changes on this next stuff. So it's actually part of the standard. It's just there, is, there are two layers coexisting in the file, and one is made to be on by default when you view the file, and the other is made to be on by default when you print the file. So it's a part of the standard. The thing is, it's not so fun because only Adobe does that. But if you think that your HR department has to use as Adobe for PDFA, then, okay, you get the idea. <laughs> but so it's a part of the specs. It's rarely used, and but there is no warning when you print and suddenly it says, hey, the layer you are viewing just asked to disappear and another layer that you didn't view suddenly has to be printed. No, there's no such warning. It's a part of the specs and I never knew about it until Kurt enlightened me. 
Uh, now let's go to the bitmap file format. And it's quite simple, but you have this little thing here. So basically, you have the file header and the bitmap header. And the file header is usually followed by the bitmap header. However, there is a pointer to this. So 99% of the case, it just follows. So you could ignore that pointer. And that's actually what happened. There's this pointer that you should read. But what happens if you actually, the parser just ignores that pointer and just looks for something that is different? And now you can create two files, one with the bitmap right after and one with the real bitmap follow, pointed by the pointer. And then you get a BMP that is displayed differently with two different viewers, one respecting the specs and the other not. And another trick is that BMP is actually quite smart. It has a run length encoding. And for that, it has some opcodes. I mean, like, it can say, OK, now I have this amount of pixels uh, with this, this color, and so on. And you can define end of line and end of bitmap. And you can also move cursor to the pointer further in the file, so that you, the, the, you could say, OK, now for this line, uh, the image is empty, just, just jump here. So what are the colors of these uh, undefined pixels? And that's the trick. Option one, the missing data would be filled with the background color. Option two, the missing data will be black. This is the same picture, of course, once again, with a different viewer. Option three, the missing data will be transparent. So once again, same file, three different renderings. Now let's look at the, port, uh, the PNG file format. Uh, PNG file format. Um, so here it's quite, quite strict. There are no pointers and nothing like this. It's just that you can have, um, you, uh, instead we will just use a palleted picture and we will combine the two pictures with two different palettes. And then with the trick is to put two different palettes in the file and, you let's, uh, and uh, let's see if the tools are respecting the specs or not. So basically the specs says there should, no, there should be only one palette chunk. And of course, this is the same file. So at this time, there is just one data combining the two files. And you can see that one palette is using the highest nibble as the palette. And the other one is using the lowest nibble. So the palette is ordered differently. So two palettes, the same image. And then, basic, because of that, here they see the same data. They use two different palettes. And because of that, the rendering is different. So it's not the same advanced trick, but it still works. And it's cute. Thanks for Dominique for the proof of concept. The PE file format. So here is a very simplified overview. The thing is, PE file format uh, is very complex. I'd say in general, and the documentation is, <coughs> yeah. Um, so to fail or fool tools that are not the Windows loader, that's just too easy. But on the other hand, fooling Windows itself is much harder because what Windows, the evolution of the Windows loader does usually just closing holes. So f for example, under Windows uh, 95, P's could be really crazy, and then those P's don't work anymore. And slowly, the loader became a bit more strict, and now, for example, under Windows 8, some P files that would work under Windows 7 cannot work anymore. Of course, not your standard compiled file, but I made quite a few. So, Basically, usually you don't have a schizophrenia because you have the same result or an older, uh, it doesn't work on the newer version of Windows. There is an exception, um, the data directory loading order. So, the, so you have all the data directories that are part of the P's. The imports, you know, these are just the, those stuff where you say, I want this function from this library, I want a message box from user32, and the loader will parse the imports and put the images of the function in the right array so you can call them directly from your code. The TLS is not so well known, and basically the TLS is usually remembered as being a part of the code that is executed before the entry point. So usually it's used as an anti-reversing trick, but TLS is not so common and not so used. However, there is another trick in the uh, TLS, is that there is address of index that is a pointer, and this address in memory will be, uh, there can be several TLS entries, and this, this address in memory will be filled with the order of the TLS loading. So if the first callback of the TLS is called, then this will be set to zero. Then if there is a second callback, this will, this will set, be set to one. So it's used as a pointer. So what if you 
point this to one part of the imports. Because the imports, they have these structures that are descriptors that define, okay, I have kernel 32 and I want to load these APIs. I have user 32 and I want to load these APIs. It's not just a sequence. And if one is empty, then it's not parsed anymore, right? So if we point this to this, if, oops, if the TLS is loaded first before the imports, then this will erase one of the descriptor. So it means this descriptor and this descriptor will be ignored, the, the loading will be truncated, and if it's the other case, then this is loaded. Now the imports are uh, par um, parsed, and if it happens after what, then it doesn't matter because the imports have been already parsed and the DLLs are already loaded in memory. So that's a first example of some schizophrenia between Windows 7, Windows Vista, and later, and Windows XP. But it's not major, but it was quite difficult because it's happening very rarely with the Windows loader. Now the other trick is that the relocations. So the relocations is that when you have two DLLs that were supposed to have their, the same image base, they will collide, so one will be loaded somewhere else, and all the references, the absolute references in the code needs to be patched by the new address. So basically, it's being, they are, it's being uh, the, the relocations are used to modify the code before it's being executed so that the new address is taken into account. So typically, the same value of uh, relocation is used, the high-low one, and the others are not used anymore, even though they are still present in the system. And I explored that. And you have those weird... So this is MIPS locations, even on the Intel CPUs. They are still present for some reason. I mean, they are called... Or they were also mapped to Itanium and they were still used in the Intel loader. Makes sense. So basically, relocations happen to have some discrepancy between all three versions of Windows. Type 4 was actually buggy until Windows 8, and it was corrected in Windows 8, even though it's actually not really used at all, as, as far as I know, but it's still present. And this Type 9 here was modified between XP and 7. Yeah, that's, it's not easy. That's XP, that's 7. Uh, hi, yeah. Huge evolution, as you can see. But then the problem is that under Windows 8, it's invalid. So if a type 9 is present in the Windows 8, the file will refuse to load and you don't have any schizophrenia. So, anyone see the trick here? What you can do? Okay, so we'll just use that one because relocations can be performed on other relocations in the table on the fly. So you basically you will use that one to patch this one into a type 10, which will be valid under all versions but not taken into account. So basically, you have first a relocation of type 4, here it does nothing, and then there's a second relocation of type 2, uh, of type 9, but in the case of Windows 8, the relocation 1 changed that one to a type 10, and then the relocation type 2, the second relocation had three different types. I mean, type 9 in two flavors, and type 10. So now you have a, ba um, a location-based PC schizophrenia. There, this was actually documented in the POC GTA 4 edition 1, if you want the proof of concept. Uh, if you're interested in uh, ELF schizophrenia, I mean, different one, then I, we advise to watch this very nice presentation, so you see what the kernel says and the, what IDA says. Two same file, two different interpretations. But once again, I didn't try to fool tools with P's because usually that's too easy. The GIF file format. The GIF file format is made of blocks, and if there is no animation speed, then all the blocks will be defined. It just makes it simpler if you have a lot of white, for example, to just define this part of the picture so that it will be smaller. If there is a, uh, a frame speed, then the first block is actually used as a background, and then the second, next blocks will be used as frame displayed independently. So now how to exploit that? You create one picture, then you create a lot of blocks, like we added 10,000, which will just be the gray pixel in the background, so the same pixel in the background, and the last frame is a full picture again. So if this is animated, then you see the cat, then the animation will start putting slowly 10,000 pixels in the, of the same color in the background, so you'll never see the cat. But if you force animation, uh, if you just display all of them at once, sorry, 
then you immediately jump to the end cut. So basically, you have once again a collision. This tool follow follow all the blocks. There's no frame speed defined, so they follow the specs. And typically, um, browsers force animation, and so they instead they start putting pixels in the corner. I mean, we could put them anywhere, but it's just more optimized this way. So once again, schizophrenia at file level for the GIF. So sometimes there are crazier uh, aspects. Uh, so for example, the same file with the same tool has two behaviors. And in this case, it's two parts of the tool are giving different behaviors. So we saw it before with Adobe printing and viewing. And also WinRA had a different behavior when viewing and extracting the threshold of how it was parsing was different. I couldn't really exploit that in a way. However, someone did with the, if you remember, the two different namings of, uh, yeah, it's not my proof of concept, but basically if you remember, the names of a file is presented in the central directory and in the local file header. And WinRA was using one for the display and using another one for the extraction. Now, what is, this is a, JPEG executable polyglot, and you double click on it and you see it's a JPEG, but it's actually on extraction, uh, becomes renamed to executable, and this is a polyglot, so it, you basically you just say, you just double click on executing an executable from the archive, while you think you were viewing a picture. So this was actually a CV because this was really easy to, to trick the, view, the user. And yeah, also Adobe printing and viewing, it's even a feature with no warning. If you, oh yeah, I'm really too short, so oh, you'll have plenty of time. Uh, so failures and ideas, because we tried more stuff that didn't work out. So we wanted to do the screen printer discrepancy by, without being dependent, depending on Adobe, with those uh, color profiles. So what if you were using a picture of a color profile from here, and from, I mean, between two different profiles and the viewer would ignore it. The problem is color profiles are usually only in professional tools and they are just not handled at all in, uh, how do you say, they are not handled at all by standard tools. Um, also, JPEG, um, I don't know if you saw my... Uh, the, my contribution in the Shawan collision, modified Shawan collision. So basically, I made two pictures co having the same modified Shawan uh, as a result. And we, we saw that uh, Irfan View had a different behavior than the other tools. We, I tried to exploit that, but couldn't, couldn't work. And FLV is a bit like BMP. It has the data that is coming straight afterward. But it, actually, this data is still used by a pointer. So what if you put one set of data and a pointer to another set of data? And my proof of concept, in one case, the video was saying it's corrupted, but the sound was still playing. So if you have suggestions on that, and I just play with FLV. I usually don't play a lot with video formats, but if you have any suggestions, I'm all ears. Also, PNG. PNG, there are plenty of chunks but a bit like the color profiles, some chunk types are not supported by a lot of tools. So I didn't find something that was uh, exploitable in a schizophrenia terms that was used by enough by standard tools. So if you have any suggestion or ideas, I'm all ears. Conclusion, we tend to take our own shortcuts. Like if there is a pointer, but not using this pointer is good enough for us, for the writing a quick parser, then it's people who tend to not follow the standard line, but take the straight path, and then that creates schizophrenia in tools. Specs are messy. They are sometimes very messy. And as you saw, sometimes they are maybe not even messy, but the historical reasons of the zip file format, not relevant anymore, but they are still in enforced today. Nobody say, okay, let's stop this floppy shit and use a zip2 from now on. That wouldn't work. And thanks to that, we, uh, Android could be exploited in 2013, just because of the floppy shit. And even though parser don't even respect them, as we saw with the PDF, the line is a command. Who gives a shit? Let's parse it anyway, or this kind of thing. And now official tools 
because they want to be as much compatible, they don't even respect their own specs, Adobe Reader, uh, Microsoft Office, but even better, they try to repair corrupted files. The file is really corrupted, they try to rebuild it, oh, I could display that. And my, I mean, what did they get in the, in the first place was absolutely not standard, but still, instead of saying, wait, this something is looking weird here, it's like, ah, yes, I could display, oh, you got exploited, here is calc. That's a bit sad. And once again, you, when you have such a passing error, no one cares until it becomes, it's actually exploitable. So you cannot report them. I mean, you can ask uh, the guys to fix them. They will listen to it or not, to you or not. But as you saw, the zip file, for, the, the zip format is parsing is completely different from one tool to the other. And it's very unlikely that suddenly they're going to say, oh, sorry, we didn't respect this stupid standard. Oh, we'll fix that straight away. Yeah, right. So, yeah, I think, uh, just to remind, uh, yeah, I think it's a bit difficult to, to find a solution to this situation because no one wants to rewrite all the specs and everything, and no one will respect them anyway. Just as a reminder, the two categories of schizophrenia are either the parsing is different and the data being seen is different. The data, they see completely different data, or the interpretation is different. So, in the, see? as a reminder of the, the bugs and how it worked. Thanks a lot to Ginfail and other people for their contribution. And if you have any questions, or you're hungry, yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Usually, uh, the, the, I don't think the spec even says what should be done officially in this case, and that was the case. Uh, you, were you here when I mentioned the, the the social engineering with WinRAR? That WinRAR was using one for viewing and the other for extracting. Yeah. It's it's not even saying oh if they are different, you should uh, stop doing anything. No. The, the, the zip specs is terrible. It doesn't even define the official names of the of each of the structure. Like here, I don't know if you can see. Oops, I cannot zoom anymore. I don't know why. So it says uh, total number of entries in the central directory. That's the official name of this of this field. It's not a num entries a CD. This is the official, it doesn't have any other official. So if you look in the uh, Zlib uh, uh, source code, they'd say they, they came up with their own variable name out of that. This is the, come from the official spec. They don't define even variable names. So, and of course, when you say that there's collision, different file names. No. You saw, I, you saw why there are different file names? You saw my zip description? Yeah, okay. Any other question or suggestion? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, but first I think only one browser use actually uh, parse the color profiles and it's really difficult to actually create your own custom ones. So it's been uh, gently documented by photo professional, but never explored in kind of reverse engineering style. So because anyway, 99% uh, of the browser just ignore the color profile, uh, the schizophrenia, um, yeah, and if, okay. So if you buy me a Photoshop license and so on, then I could explore that, but basically common public tools are just ignoring this, so there's little way for me to play with them. Really? Okay, send me send me more info. Thanks. <laughs> questions on this or questions on the previous talk? <laughs> because we didn't have the time for. Okay, thanks.